Right, thank you all. Um, sorry you've got me again. Uh, I'm using a bit of uh, one of Brian Steadman's talks uh, along with some of my own. Yanis could probably talk far more about the focus trial than me. Uh, there aren't any results from the focus trial, so I can't say so much about it. Anyway, so here we are again, liver-directed treatments, principles and practice. So if you're going to think about liver treatments, then you've got to think a little bit about liver anatomy. Liver anatomy is really quite tricky. Um, uh, part of my job as Associate Medical Director for Safety at Southampton, um, I look at all sorts of things that go wrong. And even in the last few weeks, I've been discussing a case of a liver surgeon who got a little bit lost in the liver because the anatomy can be tricky. Um, there was a chap called Quino, who's a, a French guy, uh, who first came up with the segmental anatomy of the liver. There's been various attempts to revise it and say there's nine segments or 10 segments rather than eight, but pretty much everyone's stuck to eight. Um, and that's based on uh, the internal arterial biliary and portal venous anatomy of the liver. But if you just look at the arteries, the hepatic artery feeds the liver and it splits pretty much into these eight main anatomical areas. And each part of that hepatic artery, uh, well, down at a segmental level, uh, feeds a, a lump of liver that sits pretty much on its own as an integral unit it's got its own blood supply going in from the hepatic artery and also the portal vein going in. The liver's a bit unusual. It's got two types of blood supply going into it. So it's got the hepatic artery, which comes oxygenated blood from the heart. And then it's also got the portal vein, which is nutrient-rich blood coming from the gut, uh, which also is quite well oxygenated. Uh, and so each of these segments comes with all of its uh, necessary bits. And when you're a surgeon operating on uh, the liver, so this is a segment five liver resection, uh, you can go and find the tumor. You know from the scans it's in segment five. Uh, one boundary of that is the gallbladder, which is uh, a kind of whitish thing in the top right hand corner. Um, you can work it out. You can then go down, isolate the blood vessels at the base of it so that you've got a segment of liver that comes out. Uh, I, I always show this slide, but uh, this is uh, the last segment five liver resection that I did this way back in 2005. Uh, we've done the more keyhole ever since because uh, uh, you can and it's better for the patients. So the liver blood supply is really key to understanding liver surgery and also liver therapies. Um, I was once told earlier in my training, that if I wanted to be a liver surgeon, then I'd have to be a vein surgeon of the liver. Because the tricky bit with the liver is managing the veins. Uh, if you don't manage them well, you get horrendous bleeding. And traditionally, that was the big problem with operating on the liver. So it's a sponge full of blood vessels and uh, it could go horribly, horribly wrong. So on this uh, nice little picture, you've got some red pipes, which are the hepatic arteries going in, and you've got some big fat blue pipes next to them, which are the portal veins, which are taking the nutrient-rich blood from the gut. And it's this dual supply that makes a real uh, therapeutic avenue for us, uh, an interventional oncologist when they're trying to deal with tumors in the liver. I'm going to mention something called cytoreduction, which uh, is a topic close to my heart. Um, basically, it's the concept that the less disease you've got in you, the better your immune system can mount an effective defense, the lower chance of selecting out clones of treatment-resistant disease, and the more time there is for immunotherapy to become effective. So one of the things that we look at with treatment, in particularly treatment, of patients who've got a lot of disease in the liver is just trying to reduce your tumour burden, the volume of viable living cells. 
Uh, we're not always expecting a cure, not by any means, but we're keen to try and debulk your disease. And that can be done in different ways. So you can have local treatments, you can have regional treatments, and you can have systemic treatments. So a local treatment is targeting one small area or a spot, so that might be liver surgery or putting probes in to fry it or freeze it, known as ablation. Regional therapies where you're trying to treat a whole organ, um, so that can be like chemosaturation, the Delcath, and then systemic therapies, which are those which treat disease everywhere in your body. And the aims of treatment, uh, obviously we want you to have a better quality of life, um, but we also want to achieve reduction in disease burden. We want to improve your symptoms, improve the quality of your remaining life, prolong survival, and where possible, cure. But so far, it's always been optimistic to describe cure as being our intention at the moment. But it's a long-term aim. So survival for patients with metastatic cancer. Um, we always think that uveal melanoma has to be the worst there is. Well, it's still not as bad as pancreatic cancer, really. Um, there are still uh, malignancies out there that are worse. Um, so it's always just good to bear that in mind that uh, um, there are other bad tumours around. But there's an also a lot that are much better. Now, even though we have you know, often, you look at all the statistics in the slides and they say metastatic disease, survival of months, four months, six months, eight months, and you think, oh, that's grim. Um, well, people do far, far better than that. Uh, so many of you will uh, remember Leslie Kirkpatrick, um, who has uh, been an inspiration to many of us who've uh, treated her in the past. And she was a woman who refused to give in. And I'll talk a little bit more about her in due course. Uh, she was one of those who was involved with us developing the first national uh, guidelines for management of ocular melanoma. This is the bottom half of those national guidelines, which is uh, the metastatic page. Uh, sorry, it's all really small print. Uh, obviously, those of us who would manage metastatic ocular melanoma weren't thinking of that when we wrote the guidelines. <laughs> Very poor of us, isn't it, really? Um, I'll put some red, red circles around a few bits. I can't read it myself from here, to be honest. <laughs> it's shocking, isn't it? Um, up the top, the big red uh, circle is localised hepatic disease. The one beneath it is, yes, these ones are operable. So when you've got disease in the liver, some of it's operable, some of it isn't. If it is, then the answer down the bottom is you should have it chopped out. There's no question. If you have got operable disease, the answer is you should have surgery. That's uh, overwhelmingly backed by the evidence over the decades. But there's lots of different patterns of disease. Uh, some people are lucky and we get solitary disease, solitary disease either in the liver or randomly in some other organ outside the liver. It's pretty rare to see that. And that's, I'd say, our rarest pattern of disease. Uh, but it does occasionally happen. A more common pattern is this oligometastatic, where you get a small number of well-defined deposits, sometimes just in the liver sometimes scattered around the body. But that's still pretty uncommon. The commonest pattern is a diffuse pattern. Um, and we often describe it as the measles when we see it in the liver. And the majority of our patients that we see with liver-only disease would still have multiple little dots. Um, and occasionally, we see that in patients with a more diffuse pattern outside the liver as well. So these different patterns of disease give us different approaches. And I'm going to concentrate really on those patients who've either got oligometastatic or that diffuse biloba liver disease. So if you've got extra hepatic metastatic disease and it's oligometastatic, so these ones aren't going to be operable as surgery, uh, like liver surgery, 
but they might have other options for them. And there we sometimes adopt an approach uh, which is known as cherry picking. So this is a patient called Andrea. There was a patient belonging to Yanis and myself. Um, and so uh, she had uh, eye treated originally back in, I think, 2008. A number of years later, cropped up really randomly uh, a big cystic deposit on one of her ovaries. The gynecologist only scanned the pelvis, didn't uh, stage her elsewhere, and they operated on this thing in the pelvis, took it out, and were really surprised to find it came back as metastatic uveal melanoma. She then had whole body staging, which showed that she had a couple of really big lumps in the liver. Uh, so I went and uh, removed those uh, back in November 2013. She got ipilimumab. Um, she was followed closely. She developed recurrence in her pancreas. She had uh, further rounds of immunotherapy. I think she had ipinevo, didn't she? No, she had, well, you'll tell me what she had. Hmm? Pembro. Yeah, but she had more immuno. She had at least two rounds. Um, we ended up, we did a total pancreatectomy on her randomly because her disease wasn't moving as fast as we would have expected, not by any means. Um, and although she had a lot of disease there, it was clearly it had become a life-limiting area of disease for her. And she was going to die of obstruction to the blood vessels and pipes around <laughs> the pancreas if we didn't do something about it. And so we operated uh, and took out the whole of her pancreas, which is certainly not something that you would see in the textbooks anywhere. But we looked at her and said, well, she's been going three years already with uh, this pattern of disease. She's responding to having lumps taken out. Let's keep on taking lumps out whilst it's not diffuse and everywhere. She then ended up getting further recurrence, including uh, in the base of her skull, and she opted for palliative care in March last year. Um, I think she still managed about another nine months after that, didn't she? I think it went just before Christmas. Um, so really you know, extraordinary to get five and a half years with disease dotted all over the place. And that's an example of this cherry picking, this oligometastatic disease. And it's achieving control of the big awkwardly placed lumps. And it buys time uh, so that you can have other therapies work to try and control disease elsewhere. It's an approach that we see this co combination of surgery or ablation along with systemic therapies. And we see that working for other cancers, ones that are often considered to be quite good prognosis tumors. Um, but we're finding increasingly that with new therapies around, we're using this sort of approach with other tumors like ovarian cancer, breast cancer, bowel cancer. And that's because we're managing to turn worse prognosis tumors into better prognosis tumors by the chemotherapy agents that we've got available. Um, and if you turn something into a better prognosis situation, then you start to say, well, perhaps we should now remove critically placed deposits, things that are going to become the life-limiting points of disease for this patient. And it is just thinking outside the box and looking to use all the tools that you've got in your armamentarium. Now, this is what the talk's supposed to be about, which is those patients who've got liver-limited disease but it's not operable. And this is classically the patients with that diffuse pattern of disease that make up really a, a large proportion of our patients. And uh, for them, uh, what we're allowed to do is offer, oh, for some reason that hasn't come out, uh, is we're allowed to offer regional therapies to the liver. Um, and that's within the guidelines. Now, if you're going to pick out regional therapies for the liver, then you want to try and find patients who do have liver-only disease, which means you've got to look for it. And yeah, I think it's very important. This is one of Brian's favorite slides. Julian, you're cheating. You've got to use, you've got to use the best way of looking. Um, you know, ultrasound may be good in the best hands, but 
really what you want to be using is MRI, uh, which has been backed by evidence previously. Now, if you're looking for disease in the liver, as I mentioned before, the blood supply is a little bit unusual to this organ. And you've got two forms of blood supply. You've got blood from the portal vein, as well as from the hepatic artery. And this is a, a, a series of pictures of, uh, or a series of graphs, uh, looking at different types of tumor uh, that occur within the liver. At the left-hand side, you've got the benign ones, and they get most of their blood supply from the portal vein. Uh, when you get to the far right-hand side, when you're into proper malignancy, then you find that their blood supply almost exclusively comes from the arteries, and it's often abnormal new arteries that the tumour is growing for itself uh, that are branches of the hepatic artery. And that gives us something to target, because we can attack those arteries uh, and the rest of the liver actually is relatively uh, spared by the therapy because it goes into these new arteries and not exclusively but predominantly into tumour cells. So this gives us um, some of our local regional therapies. So one is embolization. TACE or transarterial chemoembolization, and uh, DEB TACE is just a, a different uh, type of uh, uh, upgrade on that using uh, uh, a, a particular type of bead that leaches out the, the chemo differently. Radioembolization is using radioactive particles. Embolization means that you're introducing particles into an artery that go and they go down into the little branches of the artery and they uh, wedge in there and release whatever they're containing. At the bottom there we've got surgical IHP uh, and that is isolated hepatic perfusion which is moved on to percutaneous hepatic perfusion uh, which I'll talk about in a lot more detail and that's basically isolating the liver from the rest of the circulation, soaking it in chemo. So you've got a little tumour here, and the key bit of information on this is that uh, writing in red in uh, uh, the, the box, uh, bottom right-hand corner there, 50 to 200 times the vessel density. So you can have 50 to 200 times as many small arteries inside a tumour as you would in the normal liver. So that gives you an indication of just how rich their blood supply is and what a great way it is of targeting these uh, compared with the rest of uh, the liver. So different patterns behave in different ways. Um, what you really want is... Uh, an arteriogram, this is an arteriogram where you've gone up the little arteries, started off in the top of the groin, in the femoral artery there, fed the catheter up the aorta, got into the branches that feed into the liver, and you're releasing contrast dye. And what you want to see is these, uh, these little light bulbs, they're a bit dark for light bulbs, but uh, you want a liver that is, shines up with lots of these balls, rather than just being completely diffuse. Um, but patients with the measles, that's often what we see, these dots, lots and lots of light bulbs coming on for us. And it's those that we're going to be attacking. So with embolization, you're releasing something into the arteries, a particle that goes down. Now with chemoembolization, there's quite big particles, so they tend to wedge just uh, in the, the arterioles rather than the capillaries. Um, and they then release their chemo, but they also block the blood supply into the tumour. So the tumour has a double effect, and we're never quite sure how much of this effect is effect from the chemo leaching out, and how much is effect of what's called ischemia, which is starving the tumour of oxygen. 
slightly different with radio embolization where the particles are smaller and they get right into the capillaries, right deep inside the tumor uh, and they then uh, release their radiation in there. Boom, hopefully causing a lot of death. Uh, this is my mate Brian Steadman. Um, he's not the old one at the, in the bottom corner. He's uh, the younger looking guy, very fit and healthy. Uh, unlike myself. And as I say, the question is, how much of this damage from chemo embolization is drug delivery and how much of it is blocking off the blood supply and starving the tumors of oxygen? And to be honest, we don't really know. We've changed you know, through different embolic particles. Uh, we've improved the way that we deliver the chemo, uh, but still we don't really know how much is uh, which effect. Uh, this is a patient who um, we'd considered for Delcath and considered for surgery, but to be honest, she was a little bit old and uh, not as fit as she might be. She didn't want to go down the route of surgery, although that was technically operable. So we thought, let's look at a different way of treating this. And we went for a radioembolization. So that is the tumor blush showing the rich blood vessels inside the cancer and that's our kind of checkup picture and the glowing bit shows us that there's radiation uh, inside that tumor deposit which is where we want it to be um, and we follow up down the line but 12 months down the line it actually looks like it's bigger well at least she's still going 12 months you think but it has a strange delayed effect because if you look at how it looked another six months later, I can see it's demarcated and there's dieback. And she actually had really, really effective treatment of that tumor deposit. So it's a funny old treatment, um, the CERT, uh, the radioembolization, um, that you can get mistaken by looking at the CTs in the first few months afterwards. The disease can look worse when in actual fact it's an evolving pattern. And if you look far enough down the line, uh, you'll see that there's actually good tumor response. Chemoembolization has been looked at many times in uveal melanoma, never in really big randomized trials, unfortunately. Um, and perhaps one of the reasons it's never been in really big randomized trials is that the results from the small series that we've seen I would say Apache at best. I think you've got to pick your winners for chemoembolization because it is targeting the disease that you can see. You tend to try and put the catheter into each tumor uh, and release or as close to it as possible. So you're really, rather than being a full regional liver therapy, rather than treating the whole liver, you're trying to treat the disease that you can see one by one within the liver. You can probably treat half a dozen at a time sometimes more. Um, so it works best in patients who've got oligometastatic disease in the liver, who've got a few dots in the liver rather than a more diffuse pattern. And the person who's had the best results of that is a chap called Vogel, who's presented them many times. And uh, yeah, you can get good response rates, um, but you've got to pick the winners. And it's always it's, is about picking the winners. It's always saying this is another tool that we've got. Um, who's it going to work for? Um, so as I say, there's been uh, various various uh, uh, times it's been looked at. The downside of taste is that you can damage some of the other structures in the liver, particularly the bile ducts. So that's another reason we're quite cautious about using it. So what about radioembolization? So this is beta particles that are emitted from uh, radioactive spheres. And uh, beta doesn't go very far. It's not the kind of radiation that will uh, go through a lead shield or you know, zap all the way through your body. It typically only goes a couple of millimeters, about two and a half millimeters. So if you deliver the particles inside the tumor, most of the radiation is going to stay inside the tumor. Um, and it's, uh, 
uh, has a relatively short half-life, uh, but nonetheless is uh, subject to a lot of uh, radiation regulation and scrutiny. And there's a couple of types that are uh, available. There's glass beads called therospheres, and there's resin ones, which are the original ones called surspheres or surtex. Uh, there's all kinds of technical differences between them, but basically they effectively do the same thing. Um, the same thing. That's too technical for me. Um, so let's go back to Leslie. So she was a local GP that I mentioned earlier. Uh, well, I say local, she was a GP. She was from uh, Yorkshire originally. Um, and she had uveal melanoma, shortly followed by um, discovery that she had liver mets. Uh, she insisted on having MRI scans and uh, made sure that she had her disease picked up early. Um, so she had two liver resections uh, done in Leeds uh, by an old friend of mine, Pete Lodge. Uh, and then she had recurrence and went on and had cert. And she was somebody who just kept going. And she had round after round of liver targeted therapy she had ablations done to her liver as well as surgery. And she got uh, a wide range of uh, immunotherapy treatment as well. And she's somebody who lived life to the max and made sure that she got as much out of it as possible. And so she was another five year survivor uh, with multiple interventions on a bespoke pathway uh, where we threw everything at her that we could. And we didn't accept that just because she had liver disease uh, that it meant that it was all over. And we always kept on top of it and never let her get bulky disease. If you get lots and lots of disease, it's much harder to treat. If you treat small disease, it's much easier. So radioembolization results. There's not huge, huge studies in uveal melanoma again. Uh, small reports. Uh, but it does look to be effective. Uh, again, it's got a, a median increase in survival that's measured in months, not years. And unfortunately, it's not currently available on the NHS. It's something that you end up having to fund, uh, which is disappointing. But uh, the NHS has been very harsh on funding for radioembolization, uh, considering the amount of money that goes to... Uh, some systemic therapies with uh, uh, weak results and uh, twice the expense. Um, it's very disappointing. Um, we've used both Therospheres and uh, Certex in Southampton, um, found them both to be well tolerated, um, and we've uh, uh, seen you can use them in combination with other therapies as well, uh, including Delcath. Um, there are some patients who can't have Delcath uh, chemosaturation for anatomic reasons, and sometimes they can have radioembolization. So, chemosaturation, otherwise known as Delcath, which is the, the company that make the product, um, this evolved from a surgical idea to isolate the liver, flood it with chemo, again using the dual blood supply, wash the liver out during surgery, so that if you had patients with really bad patterns of disease, you could try and uh, chop out the disease that was operable and treat the rest of the liver. But that's a really uh, very invasive way of doing something and it's a one-off treatment. And so we've looked to find other ways of doing it. And we moved on from there to the percutaneous uh, chemosaturation approach which blows balloons up inside the blood vessels around the liver to isolate it from the circulation then you saturate the liver in chemo using melphalan which is a very old fashioned chemo agent but the, the liver tolerates melphalan uh, however cancer doesn't so we can give um, maybe 50 times the dose that you would normally give 
directly into the liver and achieve these massive concentrations of the drug. We have to be careful it doesn't leach out into the bloodstream because it will wipe your bone marrow out if it gets there. So we have to have the patient on uh, a filter, uh, a bit like being on a heart bypass machine. So we're diverting all of the blood from the lower half of the body through this filter, which also sits up inside the liver, sucking the blood out from the liver to try and clear it and purify it. Um, there's been some improvements to the filter. When it first was uh, created, it did have some problems that I'll show you later. So these are just some pictures. So it's pretty intensive. You need a big team in theatres, need a lot of people, and you've got to get it right. You've got to get the balloons in the right place. You've got to make sure that you have one balloon in the base of the heart, which you then pull down so it makes that acorn shape as it wedges into the uh, inferior vena cava, draining all the blood from the lower half of your body. Then you blow another balloon up uh, just below the liver so that segment of the inferior vena cava that's got the, the liver uh, plastered around it is isolated. And that takes all of the venous return out of the liver. And uh, then, what oh, is this going to do anything? Yay. There we go, a thing of beauty. Um, that's the vessels inside the liver being pumped full of uh, chemo solution, dye. And you can see that there's none of that stuff that's escaping outside, beyond, above and below the balloons. So it's a complex business. It's quite um, intensive for the whole team. It's a, a big ask for the patients. You have to be fit. Um, we've got a well-worked-out protocol that we've developed with the, the company and with other centres. Um, and. Uh, we've managed to now deliver almost 200, 190 something treatments yeah, uh, with no mortality. Um, so it has become safer. I still wouldn't say it's a safe, safe procedure because you've got to, again, you've got to be fit. You've got to have a team that really know what they're doing. And uh, there's plenty of other centres around the world that have had big problems. Um, the study that encouraged us to look at this was uh, a US study. Uh, we had 93 patients in a crossover trial. Um, and that's, as I mentioned before, crossover studies have the difficulty that the patients are on best alternative care when they progress, then get the treatment, which seems very fair, but it does make the results very hard to interpret. And if you try and unpick the results, these are the best results that you can get out from it. So if the patients who only had best alternative care, who were too unfit to then switch over to uh, the active treatment arm, as you would expect, they did horribly badly. Um, their median survival was only a couple of months. Um, whereas you compare that against those who managed to get treatment, uh, where it was uh, sort of about eight and a half months. Um, Again, overall survival on intention to treat. Uh, it, you look at that and the, the curves do kind of plateau out towards the bottom, but there is that survival advantage. Um, however, because of the crossover design and the difficulty in unpicking that, it's proved a real problem with regulatory authorities in the US. So the FDA, although it's been CE marked and so on, um, they denied it as uh, um, uh, status outside of uh, research trials still. So it's been problematic to get it going. Um, so we've looked, and as I say, these are some of our results that I'll show here. Um, we've not had any treatment-related fatalities and the level of grade three and grade four complications, those kind of relatively severe ones that uh, Yanis was talking about earlier with chemo trials, they've been low. Um, so only half a dozen patients. Um, these are some of the results from the first 50 or so patients. Uh, we've also looked at our results with Moffat University in the States, 
uh, who are the second largest um, uh, user of this worldwide. Uh, Southampton is the largest. And uh, looking at these, we actually see that we've got some significant, uh, significant evidence of patients doing well. Now, we haven't got a comparator arm here, um, but what you can see is that our patients are surviving not just a few weeks, not just a few months, but we've got patients who are a significant proportion surviving out towards a thousand days. Um, that's starting to be years that you're talking about now. So a lot of these patients will have had treatment that they don't just get a single chemosaturation episode. They may have three, they may have four, some will have as many as six. So it is a treatment that you repeat and increasingly we're thinking you should treat it like a course of chemotherapy where you have repeated uh, treatments uh, at short intervals. Uh, so you knock the tumor back and then you kick it when it's down and then you kick it again and you kick it again and you kick it again. And so increasingly that's uh, the approach to it. And uh, we think that there's a lot of potential in this. Um, Yanis was talking about waterfall plots before and I think this is the same waterfall plot that you were showing. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Um, yeah, lovely, nice, pretty, pretty. Well, does that mean anything? Um, well, this is uh, the data from Southampton and Moffat. And uh, as you said, it's those darker lines pointing down that are the patients that have demonstrated that they've had at least a partial response uh, and some of them have got complete response. So you can see there's three very dark lines at the far right. So in our first 51 patients, we've had three patients with complete response. Um, uh, complete response is the holy grail. Um, and we've got now patients that are alive five years plus out from chemosaturation. So it can be remarkably effective. Um, you've got that group in, uh, towards the, the left-hand side where the bar may be a little bit up and a little bit down. And uh, you know, there it's hard to say what impact it's had. Um, but some of those effectively will still have had a positive response. Uh, it just doesn't meet the radiological criteria to be called that as such. But anything that's an intervention that shows a greater than 50% partial response rate um, would be considered a huge success in this disease. Uh, and that's what we're seeing. So I'd really like to be able to tell you all about the FOCUS trial and tell you all about our results from the FOCUS trial, but we're not there yet. Um, I think we've got about another six months of recruitment, maybe. What do you reckon, Yanis? Yeah, six months. Yanis, do you want to tell us more about the FOCUS trial? Because you know it far better than me. Uh, So when the focus trial started, it was supposed to be almost a copy of the original trial, just updated for the modern era. So the best, there was two arms. One arm was delicate procedure, um, up to six uh, times. And the other arm was investigator's choice, best uh, alternative treatment, which included chemotherapy and immunotherapy. The problem was that as the trial was being conducted, there was more and more reports like the ones we just saw from ourselves that um, Delta, that the uh, human perfusion was actually effective uh, in controlling the disease. And it became more and more difficult to justify ethically to have this randomization. And as a lot of people mentioned, why would you want to, to, to go to a suboptimal treatment? And eventually, it got to the point where we could go to the regulators and, uh, and justify that, look, this is really highly effective treatment. Can we just not stop randomizing people? And they said, yes. So we've stopped randomizing people. So uh, people are just receiving the chemosaturation is a get on the, st on the study. Right now we're limited more by logistics than anything else. Uh, capacity is obviously quite limited in the UK because it's only ourselves and um, another center that's now going to be offering it. I think there's a third center that's supposed to be setting up, but that's been the case for about six months now, so I'm not sure if it's going to be open yeah. in time for the, uh, before the trial closes. Um, and we'll just have to see the results. Yeah, I, I think that's 
that's very fair. The, uh, the, the key thing here is that the, the design was pure to start with and um, the decision has been agreed by the regulators that, it's a, that you, we take away the best alternative care arm. And that's because uh, the unpublished, unofficial results uh, are very much in favour of this being uh, an active treatment that works. So we're hoping that we're going to get some positive results from this trial um, that will make a significant difference and that uh, we'll be able to feed into the next round of the uh, UK uh, uveal melanoma treatment guidelines. And it would be great if we had enough breakdown on those patients to be able to say that those with small volume disease do better, which is what our assessment of our own patients would be. Because that would then strongly support looking for patients with small volume disease um, with your most effective uh, surveillance and screening tools, which would be MR of the liver. So for us, it's all about integrating the different therapies, looking at the liver-directed therapies and sitting them in with the systemic management. We want early diagnosis of disease, which means serial imaging, and I'm afraid that's MRI of the liver. We want liver-directed management for those with isolated liver disease, and that can be surgery, it can be melphalan, and for us, uh, PHP, otherwise known as Delcath. Uh, and uh, for some for whom either of those aren't suitable, it might be radioembolization, uh, or occasionally it might be ablation. Uh, and then there's systemic therapies. And it's again picking the right combinations, uh, picking the right, uh, the right agents, and looking forward to clinical trials coming through, uh, whether it's IMC GP100, uh, or whether we're looking at uh, the, the, uh, the tills coming through. But at the end of the day, we need more systemic therapies. They're not going to stop us uh, uh, giving liver-directed therapies because at the end of the day, it's about giving patients access to all of these things and not being one-trick ponies. There will be some patients who will have complete response with some of the new immunotherapies and they won't need liver-directed therapy. But there'll be many more who'll have partial responses and for whom these will work synergistically. Thank you very much. Questions? Yay, questions. Thank you, Neil. I hope it's easy questions. Otherwise, I'll ask Yanis again. <laughs> He's a lot cleverer than me. Okay. PHP does show good results for liver direct treatment, but yet it's the most difficult to access due to only one centre treating three people. Will this increase? Um, well, treating three people, three people at one time, is that what we want? I'm not sure how many we... There's three people that we're allowed to actively manage through the FOCUS trial at any one time. Um, and that's due to the logistics of it, the funding from the company. Um, it, it is a real problem. Um, you know, all of the people who are involved with uh, the delivering the treatment have uh, uh, other clinical commitments and uh, uh, many other cancer types they treat. And uh, the hospital, whilst this is a trial, isn't going to invest in uh, new radiology posts, new perfusionist posts, new anesthesia posts uh, for something that may not have any funding in a year's time. Um, if we find in a year or two's time that there's uh, full, full funding for this, then that will change things because then if there's full NHS funding for it, uh, we're a national centre for it, one of whether it's two, three, four, five, however many there are, um, then um, the, the, the hospital will be able to invest and uh, will be able to do more. But at the moment, the NHS is horribly cash-strapped, as you're probably all aware from the news. Uh, although Southampton is one of the least cash-strapped, um, it's due to really, really tight budgeting. And uh, not because we've uh, 
got vast coffers of money that other people haven't got. Uh, it's just we've had a chief exec and finance officer who haven't let us be uh, do other than that which is uh, financially viable. Um, so we'll see. Um, things may change, but it, it basically comes down to money. So what are the options for the unfit? So uh, radio embolization is good. Um, uh, ablation is good. Um, so surgery, you need to be fit. When I say fit, not like amazingly fit. Um, you know, you, we'd, we'd operate on the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, you know, so our, our oldest liver resection patient is well into his 90s. Uh, we've done major pancreatic resections on patients in their 90s. Um, it's age isn't uh, a limitation. It's how many miles you got on the clock, how fit you are, how well you've been serviced. So um, you know, some people are fit at 90, some people are unfit at 50. Yeah, so, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. I have one, yeah. Here, uh, yeah. Diogo Branco from Hiya. Medical Oncology yeah, Department yeah. in Lisbon Cancer Center. Yeah. Thank you for your talk, it was amazing. I, I have a, one question about the chemo saturation and your experience in data. Yeah. Um, can you uh, give us any, any, from your analysis, any predictor that can uh, make us uh, determine which patients can have um, partial or complete uh, response from, from the treatment? Um, well, I, I think we've mentioned early stage disease, that tumor volume, uh, you're much more likely to see a stunning response with a smaller tumor volume. Um, but we do have uh, patients in Moffat as well have got uh, some of their patients. Uh, I mean, they, we, we initially set 50% tumor uh, uh, burden within the liver was our limit. Um, they went to about 70%, and uh, some of their patients who have really high tumor burdens are still alive, uh, including, I think they've got one who's nine years out. Um, so uh, it, it's not an absolute, but tumor burden is definitely the, uh, the, 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 the obvious one so far. Yanis, anything to add to that? LDH. LDH, yeah, which, yeah, that was, kind of goes along with it, really, doesn't it, to some extent. Lovely. Yeah. Any more questions on the screen, or are we all good? Nope. Have you got any on the screen? We're done. Thank you very much.